Number 10, just his bones and a beautiful memory. This one chokes me up every time. It's not only physically brutal, but emotionally brutal. Like so many superhero defeats that stick with me truly seem to be. In this case, it is Superman himself who is defeated by his friend and ally Wonder Woman. This all goes down in the story from outside of the main continuity, Wonder Woman Dead Earth. In this comic, Diana awakens in a post-apocalyptic world, where she seems to have forgotten what happened to the planet. There was a great war and following it a great fire and it is in issue 3 that she actually finds out the truth about what happened to this now dead earth and her involvement in that. What happened was the great fire and the great fire was her. In the past, in Dead Earth, the Amazons attacked humankind, and while Diana attempted to lead peace talks between both sides, this ultimately fails, and then the humans decide to basically nuke Themyscira. Diana's full power is unleashed when her bracelets are removed, but it's not enough to stop the nuclear strike against her home. In the end, her mom, her sisters, her entire world are all destroyed and lost to her. Superman rushes to help, but also arrives too late after prioritizing his own parents, who also were victims of a nuclear attack in small her power fully unleashed, heartbroken, and filled with rage, Wonder Woman takes out her frustrations on Superman. The two fight, and ultimately, this untethered and unlimited power that Diana has tapped into proves to be enough for her to destroy Clark after their fight also has obliterated the Earth via collateral damage. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button? I know there's a bunch of you that aren't subscribed, so, you know, if you want to subscribe, it just it helps us out. Number 9. The Just Justice League are dead. Welcome to Dark Crisis. Or really, welcome to Justice League issue number 75, the beginning of Dark Crisis. In this issue, the Justice League goes up against Pariah. Pariah used to be a scientist, trying to stop the death of universes, who basically became corrupted when he was cursed to watch worlds end over and over again, without being able to do anything to save them. I mean, to be fair, that would, I think, make pretty much anyone corrupted and kind of crazy. Pariah is back, and this time he intends to end the suffering of the multiverse by ending the heroes of the main continuity. He does this because he believes in destroying the main continuity, he'll kind of be able to end the cycle of destruction. Seeing it is kind of the root of the problem because the heroes from that reality have in essence meddled too much with the state of the multiverse. So he's like, in order for us to save the multiverse, we kind of got to get rid of you guys. As a result, he seemingly handily defeats the Justice League in one go, blasting them with his own power after making them fight sort of the darkness, which is like an army of evil characters they fought before, but really it's just the darkness, leaving only Black Adam to survive, return to Earth, and tell the tale of what happened. Of course, the Justice League would return, because, you know, this is comics, we gotta come back around to it. But still, this issue and their initial fate here was pretty wild. Number 8, and that will be the end of the X-Men, forever! What can I say? I'm a sucker for the classics. This one comes to us from the old days of X-Men, the Jack Kirby and Stan Lee days. In issues number 17 and 18 of Uncanny X-Men, Magneto is revealed to be the villain who has infiltrated the X-Mansion, having returned from outer space where we last saw him be transported to by the Beyonder. He has returned to once more resume getting revenge on the X-Men and mankind. It isn't until the end of issue 17 that Magneto is revealed as he greets the parents of Warren Worthington III, aka Mutant Studio. Angel's parents, having handily defeated almost all the X-Men one by one after luring them to the mansion. Magneto's plan is to send them up in an air balloon, which is basically like attached to a metal ball that contains them. Fortunately, while initially defeated in issue number 17 and struggling to escape in issue number 18, Iceman ends up getting showcased as the true hero in this issue. Kinda helps save the day here, almost single-handedly defeating Magneto just as the X-Men escape their deadly air balloon fate and return to back him up. Number seven. You are not my father. Probably one of the most emotional fights, especially when we considered that at the time we had a lot of complex emotions about, uh, well, at least one of these people, happens between Professor Charles Xavier and his star pupil, Scott Summers, aka Cyclops. I'll let you guess about who we had complex feelings about. This one went down during the events of Avengers vs. X Men. It happens at a tense time in the history of the X Men, not just because they were up against and at conflict with the Avengers as a result of a debate about what to do with the incoming Phoenix Force, but because of the revelations that had happened in recent years in regards to Charles's more shady practices. Like, 
not telling his students that the danger room they were training in had actually itself become a sentient AI mutant who was in essence uh, kind of being oppressed by the headmaster of the Xavier Institute, for example. In the end, Charles attempted to talk down Scott, who at this point had the full power of the Phoenix Force, or he takes the full power of the Phoenix Force during this fight, and uses it at his fingertips. Basically, he was also being corrupted by that. Himself filled with a bunch of complex feelings at the time in regards to Charles, Cyclops ends up refusing his once mentor's help, and instead kills him in a blaze of Phoenix flames. Despite the fact that Charles at this point was a controversial figure, he was still, I would say, considered to be more hero than villain. And despite the fact that Cyclops himself is usually known for being a hero, he still defeated a man often also known for his own heroic and idealistic dreams. Number 6 Final Fight When the Earth was threatened by incursions during the events of Time Runs Out, what did the Avengers do? Save the day? Try to stop those incursions? Not Exactly. Captain America had once been a member of the Illuminati, the secret group of heroes who banded together to resolve ideally all of Earth's problems without anyone actually even knowing. A group of super powered intellectual, philosophical and moral geniuses. At least that's what they thought. When the incursions were discovered to be a threat and the majority of the group felt that it was important to consider the possibility that they'd maybe need to destroy other worlds to sort of save themselves from it, Captain America fought vehemently against that idea. As such, his mind was wiped and he was decidedly ejected from the group. When he regained his memories, rather than use the Avengers to fight against the incursions and find a way to stop them, he actually spent the last bit of time before the multiverse was to end hunting down the Illuminati and in a toe to toe battle with Iron Man. Number 5. Create the Illuminati Sometimes it only takes one Avenger to mess up everything for all of us. And that's kind of what happened when Tony Stark, aka Iron Man of the Avengers, decided to bring together the secret superhero group known as the Illuminati. Like I said, this wasn't the combined effort of the Avengers, but when you think about the Avengers now and even before, Tony has been a staple of that team for a very long time. And the Illuminati was really his genius idea. His genius idea. Idea. The Illuminati as a group have definitely caused more trouble than they're worth, causing a lot more problems in the cosmos than they've actually solved. Playing a key role in the end of the multiverse during Time Runs Out when they couldn't save the world, helping to cause Secret Invasion and World War Hulk as well. So, yeah. Number 4 Civil War 2. Even worse by far than Civil War 1 was its follow up, Civil War 2. In this story, we got more infighting, but for less logical reasons. This time, it was Iron Man versus Captain Marvel, because I guess Iron Man just really needs to like duke it out with all the captains. This one is one we can also likely more blame on the behind the scenes, as Marvel was definitely aiming to capitalize on Civil War 1's success with this follow up, but it just didn't work out too well because Civil War 2 didn't really make a lot of sense for most readers. But in terms of the canon, Carol, I think, was hands down to blame here for just being, well, unreasonably aggressive on the matter that was up for debate. Whether or not to let Inhuman Ulysses, a precog, predict the future and then based on those predictions stop future criminals from committing future crimes before of course they even happen. Yeah, and I say that as a Captain Marvel fan. I'm a big Carol Danvers fan, but this one was pretty one-sided in my mind. Even I am like, I think Carol was wrong and Tony was right. And I don't say that very often. Number 3 Avengers Disassembled Avengers Disassembled was a story arc where the Avengers essentially imploded. What had really happened was Wanda had learned of the secret being kept from her, that she'd had fake children, which she'd in essence kind of made, who had been taken from her and then wiped from her mind by Agatha Harkness. Now, Wanda didn't like that too much, and in essence turned against Agatha, killing her before turning on her friends and colleagues, causing them to lose control, attack one another, and sicking reality warped versions basically of like Vision and Dead Avengers on them. Not only did the Avengers hurt one another, but they were made to do so by one of their own. And likely it were even somewhat responsible for Wanda getting to a point where she decided to turn on them. So really, who's to blame here? Is it Wanda or is it the Avengers? Or is it kind of everybody? Number 2 Ignoring Scarlet Witch Avengers Disassembled was bad, but likely what was worse was that it kind of could all have been avoided if the rest of the team had simply, I don't know, cared more about their teammate and friend, Wanda? Scarlet Witch had a lot happen to her, and although this is of course superhero comics where every day that you're alive there's a threat of trauma or, you know, of the world ending or both, there had been many signs that Wanda was not in a good place. Rather than do something about it or, you know, attempt 
attempt to, I don't know, get her help. Mainly the Avengers just went on as though everything was fine. I mean, I know they all each have a lot individually going on, but come on guys. If you have someone with reality warping powers on your team and they are using those powers to create fake children, which then disappear without a trace after they also lose their life partner thanks to them basically being taken apart, mind wiped, and rebuilt as a blank slate without emotion, you might think to offer them some help or you know, at least check in to see like if they need anything, if they need a hug or a a conversation. I'm not blaming them for what Wanda did, but I would at least like to hold them accountable for being pretty much awful friends to her in her time of need. Number one, no more mutants. Probably one of the worst things that at least one of the Avengers did was to threaten all of the mutant kind's existence with just, you know, a few words. Although admittedly, this wasn't so much Wanda's fault as it was Marvel's, who of course needed some reason to get rid of mutants for a bit because, you know, they'd sold the rights away and they weren't really profiting as much from comics involving mutants at that time, and they simply had too many of them. But reasoning behind the story aside, during House of M, Wanda in the end struck out at all mutants because her father, she felt, was more obsessed with fighting for mutant rights than he was with his actual own flesh and blood family. Although we'd later learn that Scarlet Witch and her brother Quicksilver weren't even really like flesh and blood family. To begin with, part of the reason that Wanda suffered the mental break, which caused House of M and later M Day, had to do with the fact that her friends and Avengers didn't seem to notice or perhaps care that Wanda was suffering as a result of losing her children. And in fact, let us not forget that Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp, of the Avengers was also the one who even kind of like caused Wanda to remember her kids to begin with. She kind of spilled those beans. So whose fault was M Day really in the end? It was still Wanda's. Wanda was the one that said the words, so it's still her fault. But Janet was there. Coming in at number 10 is Daredevil versus Bullseye. Imagine being the guy who continuously gets his butt handed to him by Daredevil to the point that you've been saved and brought back to multiple times with enhancements and he still leaves you stuck in an iron lung with the ability to do nothing but stare and talk very quietly. Imagine being that guy, and in another act of attempted vengeance, you mastermind a whole evil plan to get your revenge with your limited communication abilities, and then in Daredevil Volume 3, number 27, this red suited man without fear unravels your plans and then makes sure the jar that's keeping you alive gets filled with a toxic chemical, leaving you completely blind. Well, that's what happened to Bullseye. As Foggy Nelson said, once the deadliest man in the world, and now all he will be is a living brain inside a flesh and bone coffin. That's terrifying. Number 9, The Hulk vs. Abomination. Abomination in the MCU was once an incredibly intimidating villain, and he still sort of is, but also like, kind of like a hippie, and kind of funny. In the comics though, Emil Blonsky is absolutely ruthless. General rule for the MCU movies for you right here. If you like a character, just imagine them doing everything they do, but like turn it up to 10 and then you'll have their comic book counterpart. Mostly. What my point is here is that the Abomination is psychotic, and the Hulk is way more brutal. So, when the Abomination took the life of Betty Ross using his irradiated blood, he was not getting out of it easy. When they come head to head in The Incredible Hulk Volume 25 from 2000, it's arguably one of the best Incredible Hulk fights I've ever seen. Emil comes walking out of the water, and before he even knows what happens, Hulk is on him like shrimps on the bobby. The ground around them almost instantly becomes rubble. The fight travels under water and through a dam, flooding a whole town, all the while these two green goliaths are in a close combat slog match. And then Emil decides to taunt the Hulk, which is just dumb because it just makes him angrier, increasing his strength, and the Hulk absolutely pummels the abomination, laying on fist after fist after fist after causing minor earthquakes and leaving a meal on the edge of life with his brain exposed. It's insane. This comic really shows the relationship between these two on a level that's not really captured anywhere else, and you should read it just for their relationship, honestly. Number 8, Batman vs. Thugs. Have you ever played the Batman Arkham games? The combat in those games is absolutely fantastic, but it still leaves me wondering how many of these random street thugs actually survive after their interaction with Batman, because I doubt it. He hits hard, and he is pretty unforgiving about it. Which serves his whole point of instilling fear, sure, but I think because these nameless thugs are cannon fodder, they essentially get the worst beatings of most of Batman's villains, and we never hear from most of them again. So that tells you all you need to know. As an example, let's talk about a group of thugs in the All-Star Batman and Robin series issue number 7. Now this comic is written by Frank Miller, who seems to be able to get away with making Batman do 
pretty much anything, I guess. Like, there's no rules with Frank Miller. Like, in the opening pages of the issue, Batman comes speeding into a group of armed thugs, foot first, maniacally laughing like the Joker, and talking in his head about how Gotham is full of cockroaches. He relishes in the fact that the criminals are so scared that they are disposing of each other accidentally, and then he sets fire to a bottle of bleach and tosses it into the criminals, blanketing them in fire, and then continuously beating the snot out of them while they're on fire. And then what happens next? You'll never guess because Black Canary pops up out of nowhere and these two superheroes just start making out and getting busy while the thugs are literally barbecuing in the background. Unfortunately, yes, this is Batman, but not my Batman. Mm -mm. Number seven, Superman and the Manchester Black Beatdown. What's so funny about truth, justice, and the American way? I don't know. But what I do know is that the Superman story that uses that question as its title, also known as Action Comics issue number 775 for any of you who want to know, is awesome. Essentially, this comic sees the arrival of a group of heroes called the Elite that fight crime but in an incredibly bombastic and brutal way with no regard for lives lost. This flies directly in the face of the moralities of heroes like Superman and Batman, but apparently not. The leader of this band of villainous heroes goes by the name Manchester Black, and he has an incredible level of telekinesis, able to punch a hole in a mountain with a simple thought. He is incredibly capable, and so are his team, fixing problems before Superman can even get to the scene. Now eventually, Superman, attempting to stop them from operating using such brutal forms of justice, gets his butt handed back to him during one of their first altercations. But that was Superman with the gloves on. As fast as a speeding bullet, Superman takes down the other three members of the Elite, leaving only Manchester Black left. Now in a move colder than I've ever seen before, Superman subtly uses his heat vision through Manchester's eye and cuts the connection between Chester and his telekinetic powers. Essentially, he lobotomized Chester using his heat vision, taking the ability to use his powers at least until the JLA could arrive and he left the Elite in an unconscious Dog pile. Number 6. Dark Avengers Kill Tony Stark's Evil Brain In issue 190 of the Dark Avengers, we get a glimpse into the pocket reality of Earth 13584, where New York is one of the last vestiges of human civilization that various superhero factions fight for power over. One such faction is led by an evil Iron Man who is now just a brain. His armor was crushed by a giant Janet Van Dyne of the same pocket dimension reality. As his brain ejected from the armor, trick shot of the Dark Avengers Avengers, Barney Barton, Clint's brother, shot the brain with an arrow, killing this alternate version of Tony Stark. Number 5. Captain America Kills Steel Corpse In an alternate reality belonging to Age of X, Tony Stark became consumed by a virus which fused him with his suit, causing him to slowly be digested by it. Ew. Formerly known as Iron Man, Tony adopted the mantle of Steel Corpse following this, which he thought was more appropriate considering, well, he was basically just a corpse in an armor. He joined the Avengers team in their mission to exterminate mutants, but when they decided to rebel against their mission directive, saving mutants instead, an emergency override system caused Stark to be unable to follow suit with the rest of his teammates. Stark told Captain America to save the mutants they were targeting, which he knew meant that Cap would be forced to kill him. Number 4. Captain Marvel Kills Tony Stark during the events of Civil War II, we saw Tony Stark's Iron Man and Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel butt heads over what the best decision would be when it came to using or not using the inhuman Ulysses' future vision. This all happened after Carol had been attempting to fight Thanos, whom Ulysses had predicted would return, and during the fight, Rhodey, aka War Machine, was killed. Carol was for using Ulysses' visions to prevent possible catastrophic events, whereas Tony was against punishing or arresting people based solely on Ulysses' visions, which he thought might be flawed. The Civil War ended with Carol seemingly killing Tony, though it was later revealed he was still alive but in a coma, and then of course later on he woke back up and he would actually even come to forgive Captain Marvel. And now they don't really talk about the fact that that all happened. Number 3. Steve Rogers Kills Superior Iron Man During the events of Time Runs Out, as a final incursion threatened the very existence of the entire planet and universe, Superior Iron Man and Old Steve Rogers came to blows. They were fighting about the controversial actions of the one secret organization of brilliant minds known as the Illuminati. Also, Superior Iron Man is just kind of a jerk, so it makes sense that Captain America would be like, I'm gonna fight you, you're evil. Captain America had declared Iron Man and the Illuminati enemies due to their 
their actions, and as such, the two heroes and former friends had come to blows over the argument. Just as the world was about to end, these two fought each other to death, both being taken out by a helicarrier during their fight in their last moments before everything reset. And then Battle World happened. Woo! Number 2. Young Tony Stark Kills Older Tony Stark During the events of The Crossing, a wildly crazy story, it is revealed that Tony was a sleeper agent for Kang the Conqueror, who he later found out was actually a Mortis in disguise, posing as Kang. Evil older Tony kills tons of people before the Avengers attempt to stop him by bringing back a younger version of himself from the past who they hope can help to stop their Tony. This didn't quite work out as they planned, but in the end, older Tony and fake Kang were defeated when when older Tony, inspired by younger Tony, decided to sacrifice himself, switching back to the side of the heroes right before he died. With older Tony dead, it was decided that younger Tony would stay in the future and take his place. Number 1. Tony Stark Kills Immoral Tony Stark A crazy turn of events came about that led young Tony Stark to effectively make himself brain dead in the comics in the Invincible No More story. Following Secret Invasion, Norman Osborn created Hammer in the place of S.H.I.E.L.D. and created his own event. Avengers, which we know as the Dark Avengers, mainly comprised of villains who adopted heroic personas to mirror that of the original Avengers team. To prevent Osborn from getting a hold of information that was gathered from heroes during the events of the first Civil War as part of the Superhuman Registration Act, Stark transferred the files from S.H.I.E.L.D. computers to his own brain, and then later wiped his own mind completely, making him brain dead. Tony would later return, but not really as the same version of himself. This Tony Stark would not have the knowledge of his actions during the first civil war. How convenient. Number 10. Age of X Avengers In the Age of X storyline, the mutant population were feared, and after a phoenix-shaped explosion leveled Albany, the culling of the mutants began. In response to this, the mutant Magneto used his powers to literally steal several buildings from New York and form Fortress X, a safe haven for mutant kind. This led to the creation of a team of non-mutant heroes by General Frank Castle and led by Captain America to hunt down this resistance of mutants. The team was made up of Captain America, Ghost Rider, who was killed prior to the actual assault on Fortress X, the Hulk, Invisible Woman, Redback, who is this universe's Jessica Drew, and Iron Man slash Steel Corpse. While the team murdered a lot of mutants, Cap eventually called them off to instead defend the mutants, which activated Steel Corpse's Code Omega, causing them to take him out. There was also Plan B, which was the two megaton chemical that was carried by the Hulk. Luckily, the mutant population survived this twisted Avenger team. Number 9. Ultimate Avengers Not to be confused with the Ultimates, who are very much their own thing. This team of Avengers is actually called the Avengers, but is not the Avengers equivalent from the 1610 Ultimate Universe. Are you confused yet? Basically, in the Ultimate Universe, the Avengers team that we know and love from 616 is a little different, including in name. On Earth 1610, the Earth's mightiest heroes go by the name of the Ultimates and are pretty buddy buddy with S.H.I.E.L.D. and its director, Nick Fury. However, there is a team in this universe that uses the Avengers moniker, but they are quite different from the Avengers we know from Earth 616. On 1610, the Avengers team is more like DC's Suicide Squad. The team is made up of characters who are seen as more disposable by S.H.I.E.L.D and who are more anti-heroes or just straight up villains. They are a black ops team who is usually brought on for less mm, publicly marketable missions and jobs. Number 8. Deathlock Nation On Earth 11045, the superhumans grew out of control. They began to take the law into their own hands more and more, acting as judge, jury, and executioner. This led to popular support from the people for Operation Deathlock. Operation Deathlock was a plan conceived by Weapon Infinity of the Weapons Plus breeding facility called the world to convert all superhumans into deathlocks. The project began small with a few normal human deathlocks, and then those deathlocks targeted specific heroes who were killed and then converted into super deathlocks. No hero could stand for long, and soon all superheroes were converted into mindless police robots, which actually resulted in a utopia. Eventually, these deathlocks began spreading into other timelines and realities, only to be stopped by apocalypse. This eventually led a team composed of Deathlock Captain America. 
Cyclops, Spider-Man, Elektra, Hawkeye, and The Thing to come into conflict with Earth 616. Number 7, Cadaverous's Avengers. Cadaverous's Avengers were part machine, part man, and all influenced by the villainous Cadaverous. They show up in whatever alternate world JJ Abrams and his son Henry Abrams Spider-Man series is relegated to. I don't think it has an official number yet. It does have a temporary reality number though. This team seemed hell bent on getting revenge on Iron Man. The only surviving Avenger left in this world. Well, I guess Peter was still alive at this point, and I mean, he's normally a part of the Avengers team, at least at some point, but I mean, in terms of the standard Avengers cast, we've all come to familiarize ourselves with through various forms of media, including the films. I mean, especially the films in this case, just based on the roster. These villainous corpse versions of the former heroes face off against the old Iron Man, Iron Heart, Spider-Man's son, Ben Parker, and his powerless but enthusiastic friend and love interest, Faye Ito, or is it Ito Faye? Needless to say, these evil counterparts at least weren't in control of themselves, but instead were being influenced by Cadaverous to fight against their former friend and colleague with the use of old Stark Tech neurochips. At number six, we have Swordsman. With the biggest accolade being that he trains Hawkeye, it's hard not to squeeze this guy onto the list. Basically, Swordsman starts off as a circus performer who is known for demonstrating his mastery with bladed weaponry. He was more of a showman than a superhero realistically and also more of a villain than a superhero if we're being honest. After losing all his money due to his gambling addiction, he decides to steal from the carnival paymaster and when a young Hawkeye chases him, Swordsman almost kills his own apprentice. And then fast forwarding, the way that he's eventually admitted into the Avengers is basically through fraud. He teams up with Mandarin and sends a fake message posing as Iron Man to the Avengers to allow himself into the group and it works. Being a double agent for Mandarin, he later lures the Avengers into a bomb with the intention of blowing them up. Although he does try to dismantle it in a moment of regret, he's still dejected from the Avengers anyway. I think they just sensed he was screwing around with them. He then basically just falls back into a life of crime while picking up a drinking habit along the way which isn't part of the reason I put him on the list. It's kind of sad. He's a very troubled character and just had some nasty intentions and tendencies. Not the most noble of the Avengers by any means. At number five, we have Jack of Hearts. This guy is notoriously one of the worst Avengers because his most notable act as part of the team is murdering another one of the members. Although he does this while under the influence of Scarlet Witch, there's no hiding from something so brutal. I mean, the Avenger he kills is Ant-Man, who's a really important member of the team. Aside from this though, Jack of Hearts also just spends such a short time with the Avengers that even his heroic deeds are sort of weak, regardless of the tragedy. Being the 52nd member of the Avengers, he's brought on specifically to help take on Kang the Conqueror. They all team up with the Justice League and a huge battle goes down. And then promptly after this, Jack tragically decides he needs to end his own life for various reasons, taking a villain with him who had killed Ant-Man's daughter. But it's pretty ironic that the next time he makes an appearance, he blows himself up and takes Ant-Man with him. Just a messy run as an Avenger through and through. At number four, we have Stingray. This guy isn't ever really a true member of the Avengers. He is officially, but he only seems to jump on as part of the group when they need him, like when they need access to his underwater hydro base or when an inverted Doctor Doom brings him on to rescue civilians from a river. He's sort of their fringe friend that they use for water related issues. Could this be a case of lazy writing? Perhaps. But it seems more like he's not really a strong enough character to do much more than pop in and out of the scene when water gets involved. He also almost fights Iron Man due to a misunderstanding right when he joins the team and even campaigns to have him removed from the Avengers which is just an awful way to start. At number three is Star Fox. This guy is just a bad hero. He's not even really a hero. His powers are extremely problematic in that he can basically gain the love of a woman on command, but it's not really love because it's artificial and it only lasts for so long. So when he uses his powers, these women often wake up not knowing where they are or what they've done, which is naturally a pretty deplorable thing to inflict on a person with your powers. And he doesn't even seem to feel badly after it either. He just gets his clothes on and jumps out the window like 
See you later. Good luck piecing together the last 12 hours. Otherwise known as Eros of Titan, this guy is actually Thanos' older brother, so this sort of explains the evil nature of his powers. At least in the comics, they're kind of aware of his nasty nature, because the woman who he's used his powers on eventually come out and sue him because of what he does, which has to be a first for a superhero. I'm honestly just surprised that this dude even had a membership to the Avengers in the first place. He just, just kind of sucks. At number two is D-Man or Demolition Man. This dude should never really have been brought on to join the Avengers. He's sort of just this unmotivated, scraggly guy with a horribly designed suit. He just steals Wolverines and Daredevil's costumes and makes a tragic mashup of the two. His origins are that he's basically a wrestler that was given superhuman strength before befriending Captain America. When Cap needs to reform the Avengers, he thinks it's a good idea to bring on D-Man to join the team. But this choice is pretty obviously out of sympathy for the guy because he doesn't really do much when he does join. He's then sort of left behind and lost in time, becoming more and more unmotivated as the years go on, eventually living in homelessness before becoming a sort of villain. Not the best track record for even an alum of the Avengers. But I can't totally rag on him. The Avengers have insanely high standards and some people just want to hang out and eat sub sandwiches. So that's D-Man. The number one spot on this list goes to Dr. Druid. Having been trained under the same mentor who trained Dr. Strange, you'd think this guy would have gone on to be a great member of the Avengers. Well, at first he wasn't actually known as such a bad hero by his own right, but after joining the team, it becomes pretty obvious that he wasn't destined for greatness. His attitude is arrogant, he carries a lot of insecurity about living in Strange's shadow for so long, and he also has a big weakness to the charm of women, proving him to have a pretty low emotional intelligence. And this is a pretty major fault when you're supposed to be an Avenger because you need to be able to have a strong character regardless of whatever your power set is. This also tends to lead him to be a subordinate to women in positions of power like Captain Marvel, who he continually undermines until his disloyalty leads to her being seriously injured in battle. He then tries to convince everyone to name him the successor as the new chairman. This guy, Dr. Druid, was just kind of a weak-minded, fool who was conniving and subordinate through and through. It's surprising he was ever brought on board with the Avengers because he really proves himself to be one of their weakest links while he's there. Coming in at number 10 is Batman vs Prometheus. This may be one of the silliest yet coldest Batman takedowns I have ever seen. In fact, down in the comments, I want you guys to let me know your favorite absolutely wacky Batman takedowns. But for now, let me explain this one. The first time Prometheus encounters the Justice League, and specifically Batman, he overcomes them all, just showing how much of a force to be reckoned with that he is. As for how he brought down Batman in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the villain does what all villains do and gloats about how he did it. Using his helmet, he is able to program the skills of the 30 greatest martial arts masters in the world, including Batman himself into his body and brain for his own use. Not one to be outdone like that though. When the time comes for the rematch, Batman cheats and forces Prometheus into using an older version of his helmet, but this version had been tampered with by Batman so that instead of the 30 greatest martial artists, Prometheus now has access to the physical abilities and skills of none other than Professor Stephen Hawking. Now Batman could very easily punch the lights out of Prometheus who is stuck with muscular neuron disease that renders him a drooling catatonic. God, it's it's almost offensive, but it's just so good and such a Batman thing to do, like outthinking his opponent like that? Mm. Ah. Number 9, Magneto versus the Red Skull. Magneto and the Red Skull are on opposite sides of history. Magneto grew up in a Jewish family living in Germany during World War II, and we all know Red Skull and Hydra stance in World War II Germany, so it's safe to say that these two villains will almost never get along. Right? In Acts of Vengeance from 1989, Magneto and Red Skull were actually temporarily united. But it's really important to note that Magneto was unsure whether this was THE Red Skull that aided Germany in the slaughter of his people. So Magneto confronted him and the Red Skull confirmed that he was indeed the original, which was a mistake. It didn't take much for Magneto, the master of magnetism, to overpower the skull. But unlike what you might think, Magneto does not take his life. Instead, Magneto leaves the skull isolated in a stripped down fallout shelter 20 feet underground. He removed the ladder from the escape 
patch, gave him 10 gallons of water, took out his homing transmitters, gave him no food and no light, just water, air, and his own depraved thoughts. Number 8. Peter Parker vs Kingpin If there's one thing you just don't do, it's messing with Aunt May. After Peter had revealed his identity to the world, his past villains were all coming back to get some more personal revenge. This put his family in danger, and despite his best attempts to protect them, when an assassin tried to bring him down, he dodged out of the way and Aunt May happened to be in the line of fire. This transitioned immediately to the Back in Black Spider-Man arc, which saw Peter don his black spider suit and go on a warpath to find out who was responsible for hiring the assassin. Eventually, Peter learns that it was none other than Kingpin who hired the goon. Fisk was in prison at this time, but using an extremely large stash of cash that he somehow had hidden within his prison furniture. I don't know, it's a comic book, just roll with it. Fisk was able to get out of his cell, release the other inmates, and get about halfway through the prison before Spider-Man came crashing in. And after letting Kingpin monologue a little bit, he proceeds to lay an incredible beatdown on the Kingpin of crime in front of an entire prison wing of his underlings. But then, to make it much more personal, Spider-Man takes off the black suit to show that it, it's Peter Parker beating the snot out of Kingpin. Then he slaps the hell out of Fisk, threatens to spin webbing down his throat, and then explains how pathetic he is in front of all of his underlings, striking right at the Kingpin's massive pride. Number 7. Jericho vs Vigilante Joey Wilson, aka Jericho, is technically usually a superhero, despite being the son of Deathstroke, one of the world's best assassins. The same serum that gave Deathstroke his powers and enhancements also gave Jericho his powers, but they differ largely from Deathstroke's. Jericho has a very unique and powerful ability that allows him to transfer his consciousness into the body of another and take control of them by making eye contact with that person. Unfortunately, Every time he did this, a small shred of the individual's psyche remained in his head. At first, it was nothing that he couldn't deal with, but over time, possessing multiple people, he had so many psyches running around his head, it drove him insane and put him on a warpath that needed to see him brought down. The rogue anti-hero known as Vigilante was the one to take on the responsibility of stopping Jericho. But because of Jericho's sister insisting that Jericho was a good person at heart and should not lose his life, Vigilante decided to not deal with this threat in a completely lethal way. No, instead, Vigilante just completely took Jericho's eyes from his head. Blind and unable to use his powers, the threat of his abilities was gone. But I'm pretty sure it did nothing to stop his mental instability. In fact, it likely made it worse. Number 6. The Gatherers The Gatherers are a team of former Avengers of different alternate realities who survived their world's destruction. Tricked by an alternate reality Black Knight named Proctor into believing that their world's Circes were to blame, Proctor united them together and gave them a single enemy, the Circe of Earth 616. The team consisted of alternate reality versions of Proctor, Rick Jones, The Thing or Korg, Swordsman, Black Panther, and The Vision as well as some unknown original villains. But for them to carry out their vengeance, each member had to kill their Earth-616 counterpart within a certain amount of time, or they would die from cellular breakdown. What the members of the Gatherers did not know is that their leader, Proctor, was responsible for the destruction of each world they are from, as he drove that world Circe into madness, causing her to lash out and destroy everything around her. All because of a bad breakup. Damn, dude! Number 5. Android Ultimates The Android Ultimates come from Ultimates 3. They make their first appearance in issue number 4 of the Ultimates 3 series. This is where we first learn that these Ultimates aren't really the Ultimates at all, but replacements built by Ultron to act just like them. His plan is to use the team of robotic hero impersonators to destroy man and help the machines of the world rise up. Really all machines too. There's a weird part where they're talking about like, we as machines are just seen as these tools. Us toasters, we will unite! <laughs> It's like very strange. Of course, the Ultimates themselves will have a few things to say about that whole plan. Ultron styles himself after his father Ant-Man, but he and his team wouldn't make it past the next issue. It would later be revealed that their leader Ultron wasn't actually fully in control, but instead was being puppeted by Doctor Doom. So many reveals where people are actually being controlled by someone else. Number 4. Undead Avengers The living are not welcome on Earth-666, and the world is only consisting purely of the dead. Undead or supernatural beings. Vampires, werewolves, mummies, and more all exist here, and each group is divided into separate factions. But don't fear, the greatest heroes from across these groups are assembled together to protect this world. They are 
the Undead Avengers. This team is so cool. A Captain America who never recovered from being a werewolf. A part spider Natasha Romanov. A devil daredevil. A mummified Thor the Accursed who wields the backwards Mjolnir that casts black anti-magic energy. Vampire Wolverine. Where Hawkeye? Franken Castle? I mean, come on. These guys come into conflict with Captain Britain when trying to defend the orb of necromancy in order for them to spread undeath across all of reality. And they first appear in Secret Avengers number 33. Number 3, Dark Avengers. The Dark Avengers technically hail from Earth 616, but they are a completely alternate team when it comes to their roster and in general their backstory and motives. Well, that is in a way, the Dark Avengers do attempt to do good, but they are just all approaching it from a more villainous side. And many of the team members don't do good for the sake of doing good, but have their own ulterior motives. So can we really call that good? Oh, that's a philosophical question for you. The Dark Avengers were introduced when Norman Osborn was given reign over the heroic team after he'd been declared a hero for killing the Skrull Queen, Veronki. Aside from getting to build his own Avengers team, which would replace the previous one, S.H.I.E.L.D. had been disbanded and Osborn was allowed to create his own or organization to replace it, using the acronym HAMMER, which really doesn't stand for anything. Osborn just thought it sounded cool, so that's not really an acronym, it's just capitalized letters at that point. He pulled together his own Avengers team, which publication-wise became known as the Dark Avengers, composed of various Marvel villains, anti-heroes, and misled heroes in some cases, or heroes who were just like really lost at the time, who Osborn united when the standard Avengers hero members refused to join his team. He did try though. <laughs> he was like, hey, Carol, come be on this team. She was like, uh, hell no. <laughs> Number two. Zombie Galacti. I think most of us are familiar with Earth 2149, which is the home of the Marvel Zombie storyline. Here, a separate reality zombie infected sentry was sent by his Earth's Watcher. The Avengers were the first on the scene and quickly died or were infected, with the rest of the population falling quickly afterwards. Once the Herald of Galactus, the Silver Surfer, showed up to announce the arrival of Galactus, he was consumed by Hulk. Wolverine, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Giant Man, Power Man, and Captain America, who absorbed his powers and used it to toast other zombies to improve their flavor. Gordon Ramsay would not approve. The zombie Galacti used the machine to unite their power cosmic to take down Galactus and, after fighting their zombie villains, consumed and absorbed his power too, using it to spread the infection throughout the whole of their universe. Number 1. Revengers The Cancerverse Avengers, known as the Revengers, hail from a reality where the world was turned upside down by the fact that death was defeated. I know, how can you kill death? Well apparently when you make deals with elder god-like beings, anything is possible, like what happened here. In a bid to save Captain Marvel from life-threatening cancer, a deal was struck with the many angled ones. As a result, death ended up dead, which actually resulted in the whole universe becoming a perverted version of itself. You'd think without death around, the universe would become like a paradise, but no. It became rank with disease that spread and basically couldn't die, becoming known as the Cancerverse. All the heroes who remained here were made to serve the many angled ones, becoming their loyal servants and attempting to invade other universes eventually and conquer them in the name of their Lovecraftian horror-esque gods, Avengers included or Revengers included. Number 10, Iron Man almost kills Tony Stark. Iron Man is really good at making suits, sometimes too good. At one point, he decided to make an AI suit instead of an AI to be used in his suit. This artificially intelligent suit did what most artificial robotic intelligences do, it almost immediately became evil. Although Tony did also decide to use some Ultron code to construct it, which honestly probably was not such a good idea, especially for someone who is supposed to be a computer genius. In the end, the suit created programming that allowed it to feel emotions, and after fighting with Tony Stark and trying to get him to forcibly merge with itself, it eventually felt remorse at its action while during their fight, Stark suffered a heart attack. The suit sacrificed its own life, giving Stark an emergency and what looks like terrifying artificial heart transplant. Like you can still see the artificial heart sticking out of Tony's chest. That that does not look sanitary to me. Number 9. The Avengers Kill Iron Man Okay, okay, so the Avengers weren't solely responsible for his death this time around, but they definitely were the ones who caused it to happen. Nah, 
at least in part. During the events of Armor Wars, Iron Man became branded a criminal by the United States government. Among those opposing the vigilante were fellow Avenger Captain America. This however happened at a time where Tony Stark was not known to be Iron Man. His identity remained a secret and Stark simply claimed that the man in the suit was actually his bodyguard, often remote controlling the suit to kind of make it appear as though they were in the same place at the same time so no one would question his explanation of the identity for Iron Man. In the end, Stark decided because of being declared an outlaw to kill Iron Man, claiming that the man in the suit was named Randall Pierce and staging Pierce's death by allowing an empty remote controlled piloted suit to be destroyed during a confrontation with the government. This would later allow Tony to reveal himself as Iron Man, though he would at first claim another employee of his had simply taken up the mantle. But we knew the truth. It was really Tony in that suit. Once again. Number 8. Zombie Hulk Kills Zombie Iron Man During the events of Marvel Zombies, pretty much almost all of the zombified heroes meet their end at one point or another. Save for a lucky, or I guess unlucky, few? Iron Man is not one of the zombified heroes who makes it, however. He is one of the victims of Zombie Hulk, who kills a bunch of other zombies when they start getting angry with him for... Well, for eating so much, as they fear their food supply of brains and meat is running low. Zombie Hulk crushes Zombie Iron Man to the point that blood sprays out of his mouth and eye holes of his armor. Basically, he squishes him like a grape. Number 7. Tony Stark Sacrifices Tony Stark In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it was Tony himself who killed Tony. Or while he chose to sacrifice himself in order to ensure the events of Thanos' snap at the end of Infinity War, which initially wiped out 50% of all living beings at random, including half the population on planet Earth, remained reversed. So unsnapped, if you will. In order to bring everyone back, the heroes needed to time travel to retrieve the Infinity Stones and use them to create their own Infinity Stone gauntlet. Then the question came of, you know, who was going to wield it? The Hulk was the one to bring back everyone using the gauntlet, but Thanos from the past returned to threaten the heroic plans of the Avengers. He attempted to guarantee that his future self's plot, and really his own plot, remained successful, but Tony managed to get rid of him, wielding the gauntlet himself and using it to wipe out Thanos and his army with his own snap. Unfortunately, because Tony Stark is just a man at the end of the day, the amount of energy this required ended up killing him, despite him wearing his Iron Man armor at the time. Number 6. The Day the Proudest Most Noble Man Ever Finally Fell Obviously, I'm kinda trimming down that quote a bit, but... It just fits a little bit better in my point. What an iconic defeat. So iconic it not only shook the comic book world, but also the everyday world as well, making headlines. And sure, all in all, this was kind of a publicity stunt to help boost comic sales, but it also became a huge story for comic book fans everywhere to look back on for years to come. While Superman would return, his defeat against Doomsday and ultimate initial death in the comics would be felt the world over. The death of Superman is epic, and I personally always like coming back to it, not just for Clark himself, but for the characters that are a big part of his world. Lois and Jimmy, his parents, John and Martha, ugh, makes me feel so many emotions. Also, why was Jimmy so handsome in the 90s? I ask myself that every time I return to Superman comics in the 90s. I'm like, Jimmy, you're looking real jacked. Number 5. Take heart, kitty. Oof, this one hits me right in the feels. I go back to what it felt like the first time I read this one, and whoo, it got me. This defeat comes to us from the pages of one of my favorite ever X books, I believe, the first volume of Marauders, which started back in 2019. I think this is one of my favorite X books of all time. I mean, I'd have to really like think about that and rank those, but pretty sure this is up there if it's not in the top five. Although, I think it is in the top five. For me. In issue number six, we're caught off guard when Sebastian Shaw shows up on a boat where Captain Kate, the leader of the Marauders, has been left alone. Now, for those who haven't been keeping up with, you know, the Krakoa era X Men stuff and what it means for Kitty Pride, initially she had problems using the gates on the island and basically became the captain of a ship and the leader of the Marauders. Not Sinister's Marauders, not those Marauders. She was reclaiming the name for a heroic group of buccaneers that would basically sail the seas and help to free mutants in countries where they otherwise were not free helping to bring them to Krakoa. And honestly, the team is also star-studded. Here, Kitty preferred to go by Kate. That is, until she died. Sebastian Shaw shows up to attack Kate with fast-growing Krakoa seeds. Considering she can't use the gates and currently can't phase through Krakoan 
materials, Kate becomes restrained as a result. Lockheed is netted and tossed overboard, and Kate is left to sink alone along with the ship she is on, which Sebastian, of course, blows a hole in. This plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected, as this plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected by the five as a result of her inability to interact with Krakow and Gates. Number 4. Everything Cracked The final crisis story is all about the brutal defeat of superheroes and really kind of like everyone on Earth. Final Crisis was the story of how Darkseid basically took over the world by broadcasting the anti-life equation to everyone on the planet via email, text, radio, and television broadcasts, basically making them realize that he is the one true ruler of everything and so they may as well just give up and surrender to him. It was brutal, devastating, and honestly affected pr pretty much everybody in the comics. Eventually the heroes would manage to rise up and take back the planet, but for a while there, oh, it was really bleak. Things got so bad that they even caused Batman to break his one rule against using guns in order to take on Darkseid. And this event started with the death of Martian Manhunter as well. Rough. Number 3. The One True Enemy of the Great Charles Xavier Oh boy, we are going to the Ultimate Universe for this one, so you know it's gonna be brutal, right? This comes from the Ultimate X-Men series. Here, Sinister, who looks super different in this universe, so if you're like, wait a minute, who's that? That's Sinister? Yeah, it is. He infiltrates the X-Mansion and manages to sneak up on Charles Xavier himself, despite his immense telepathic powers. Xavier here is no match for Sinister, who takes him out of the security security room he was in, where he was seemingly surveying his students. When Charles asks Sinister where he's taking him, Sinister responds that he's escorting Xavier to his one true enemy, and then he pushes him down some stairs. Hmm. It's completely awful, really. Xavier isn't the only one who gets brutally and honestly insultingly messed up by Sinister in this issue. Angel also in this fight goes from being intimidating in one panel to basically mentally manipulated into choking himself against his will in another panel. So yeah, which I mean, I don't know. I kind of expect something like that for Angel, but Xavier? It's not fair. It's not very. That's terrible. <laughs> Number two. Instead, I will simply break you. Possibly one of the most powerful moments I've ever read in Batman comics. This epic issue that was an integral part of the Nightfall story is a whirlwind of a fight. And not only that, but overseen by a powerful inner monologue from Batman about all the wounds he has taken to get to this point that truly highlights the struggles that really sum up this character, who against all odds always comes out on top. Right? Not this time. And issue number 497 of Batman. This was the moment that Bruce fell in his fight against Bane. Bane came to finish him, but rather than kill Batman, decided to simply leave him broken, breaking his back over his knee in that massive and iconic splash panel. Number one, but I saved you. I did it. Ugh, this one made me cry all over again as I sat at my desk and reflected on it, revisiting it again. Oh boy, okay. So here we're talking about the death of Spider-Man, which honestly happened more than once in the ultimate comic book line and universe, but I do think that this is my favorite death. Hmm. This is Spider-Man's death done right, is what I mean, in my mind. If you have to do it, obviously, because I don't think many of us would really ask for something this heartbreaking to happen, but you know, here we are, it happened, and it's so sad. During Ultimate Spider-Man issue 159 through to issue 160, we see Peter in his final fight, in the final moments of this final fight. Unmasked and with nothing really left to lose, he is forced to give it his all to protect the people of New York City, and more specifically, his friends his family, his loved ones, and the people of his own neighborhood. In the end, despite everything he does in this epic fight, which spans multiple issues, he is defeated by the Green Goblin. And the ultimate version of the Green Goblin is an unstoppable, and as we'd later find out, a mortal tank of a villain. This fight and defeat has it all though. Ups, downs, it's an emotional, action-packed roller coaster. And while Spider-Man does seemingly die, so seemingly does Norman Osborn as well in the end. So while this is a defeat, there's also at least some poetic justice felt in the end too. But goodness, Aunt May, whew. Boy, do I feel for Aunt May here. Oh, it's so awful. At number 10, we have Sandman. Although his redemption arc is really great and has so much potential, it sort of falls flat. Basically, the thing one day sits Sandman down and tries to turn him to the good side, 
And it works. With Sandman now finding his stride as a hero, he first joins the Outlaws, a team of reformed Spider-Man enemies, and is then given a membership to the Avengers. It's all going in the right direction for the former villain until he's promptly hypnotized by Wizard and turned back to the dark side. Honestly, this isn't even Sandman's fault, but his quick turn back to evil gets in the way of him being anything close to a functional member of the Avengers. I almost didn't even put him on the list just because he barely even does anything for the team after he's inducted. And even tragically after that, he even goes off to reform the Sinister Six right after leaving the Avengers Reserve, which basically erases any good he may have done during his time as an Avenger. At number nine, we have Justice, FKA Marvel Boy. Although he's known as a pretty well-respected hero, at least in his later years, Justice still doesn't do much for the Avengers during his time with them. When he first joins, he comes off as more of a fan than anything else, making some rookie mistakes right off the bat. He also finds a way to break his leg, which isn't very common for a superhero. Much of his lack of maturity in the group is due to his worship for the other members of the Avengers, so it's hard to blame him, although he does do some pretty good work in planning to take down Ultron. Later, he ends up teaching for the Avengers Academy alongside Hank Pym, Tigra, Quicksilver, and Speedball. But overall, this character's time with the Avengers is wrought with scattered accomplishments and distracting love triangle storylines that just make him a much less effective member of the team. At number eight is Sentry, who joins the Mighty Avengers after having one foot in the door of the new Avengers for a while. This guy is a poor addition to the team simply based on issues of power imbalance and, unfortunately, his own mental health. On the power side of things, he's so powerful that he sort of drowns out the efforts of the Avengers as a team, which in many ways is a good problem to have. But on top of this, due to his mental health issues, he tends to have trouble reining in his power set and often second guesses himself. I feel badly for the Sentry, and I only put him on this list because sometimes people just aren't right for a big team. When it becomes clear that Sentry is fighting some internal battles, he is still known as the most powerful member of the team, but just needs to figure himself out first. For example, at one point, Sentry attacks Ultron at a moment when the team needed him to hold back and sort of ruins the whole plan. Although the attack was in retaliation for Ultron seemingly killing his wife, so it's not that unexpected. It's just one of the many times that Sentry has troubles keeping his composure and taking on the responsibilities of an Avenger. He's not a bad hero, just maybe not right for the best superhero alliance ever created. At number seven, we have US Agent, or John Walker, formerly a stand-in for Captain America. His true colors show when Steve Rogers returns and Walker is renamed US Agent, which is just a bunko name if you ask me. I had to put him on the list even though he does the honorable deed of taking over as Captain America when Steve Rogers goes a wall and becomes nomad. He's just a little too intense on the patriotism front and brings the team down as a result. A huge part of Steve Rogers' influence on the Avengers is his ability to shelve the burden of America's unofficial, but basically official superhero, and keep his intentions focused on acting in favor of others. He's able to put aside his pride and work for the team, whereas Walker does the opposite. He does work for the team, but it's a big lesson in the importance of good attitude because they have the same powers, but something about John Walker's suffocating patriotism and inherent arrogance that comes with it just proves that no one could do the job like Steve could. And once again, US Agent is just such a lame name to take on, unrelated. Especially after having gone as Captain America for a time, it's just, maybe I just feel badly for him in a way. Number six, Magneto beating Apocalypse. Magneto and Apocalypse are two incredibly powerful mutant villains with frighteningly similar goals, and yet we never really fully see them teaming up. But we also rarely ever see them fight either, except in the Age of Apocalypse reality. In this world, the mutant Legion had gone back in time in an attempt to bring an end to Magneto, but he inadvertently caused the passing of Xavier, his father, which led to a world where Magneto forms and leads the X-Men, and Apocalypse has nearly taken over the whole world. This all came to a head in X-Men Omega. Now, on paper, while Magneto is powerful with a capital P, when compared to Apocalypse, he should be a walk in the park for the second mutant to ever exist, and their fight going on simultaneous with about three or four other little skirmishes is intense. It's full of great lines, crazy twists and turns, but the best part is right near the end. Apocalypse has Magneto on the ropes, and he gloats in his own glory, wondering why the master of magnetism isn't fighting back. Now staring straight into Apocalypse's eyes, Magneto says, I can't. 
I'm concentrating. And then they both look down to see Magneto's hands at his abdomen as he completely rips Apocalypse in two straight down the middle in the most awesome looking panel I have ever seen. It's so good. Number five. Invincible. Invincible, Mark Grayson, is an incredibly strong character. Being a Vilchermite, Invincible is a member of one of the most unbeatable species in the galaxy. Mark is also a young adult, who hasn't learned how to control himself or his powers completely. So, it's interesting that one of his greatest enemies is an incredibly squishy man by the name of Angstrom Levy. That's because Angstrom is pretty intelligent and ruthless, but also because he has the ability to open portals to alternate realities. Using his knowledge of of other dimensions, he was able to figure out the alter ego of Invincible and find out where Mark lives. He travels to Mark's home and then captures Mark's mom and brother. First of all, making things this personal never works out for a villain, so they need to stop doing that. But Angstrom does actually put Mark through a good old fight, using portals to send the hero to multiple different dimensions, which was really cool, honestly. Where Levy made a big mistake though was when Mark's mom, Debbie, decides to try and attack the villain using a lamp, smashing it over Levy's big old head. Levy didn't take too kindly to this little affront and he broke Debbie's arm. Now in a fit of absolute blinding rage after seeing this, Mark charges full force at Levy and they end up crashing through multiple realities until they land in a sandy desert wasteland. Which is when this idiotic guy Levy decides to threaten Mark's family again. Invincible, still in this blind rage, uses all the strength he has, completely pummeling Levy until Mark looks like he's covered in ketchup and angst is now a huge puddle, but somehow he still comes back. Number four, Conquest. Yes, we're still talking about Invincible. For the Vilchermites of this Invincible comic series, they have extremely high resistance to damage, but what makes them even more capable is that when they do get beat down, usually by another Vilchermite, and they survive the damage, once they heal up, they become even stronger than they were before. It's why the oldest Vilchermites are usually the most powerful of the bunch. Now one old timer Vilchermite goes by the name of Conquest, and he is one great grizzled old man. Battle scarred as hell with a cybernetic arm and psychotic as hell as well, he arrives on Earth to check on Mark's progress with taking over the planet. That's a whole long story, we don't need to get into it. Essentially, he arrives after Mark had just gone through some sh**. I can't say that. So Mark is not in the best mood, but Conquest does not care, and these two have an absolute slog of a battle over the course of four issues of the comic. It's Insane. Conquest takes a few hits, sure, but Mark is no match for this guy in the slightest. In an attempt to help Invincible, his girl, Adam Eve, decides to show up on the battlefield and lend a hand. And she was far out of her league, but she's very powerful. Didn't really matter. Conquest punched a hole right through her. This was the line that you just don't cross. It sends Mark into a frenzy. The two Superman-like beings fly straight at one another and Mark punches straight through Conquest's cybernetic arm, breaking his own arm in the process. He uses his unbroken hand to clock the old man in the face. He bites a massive chunk out of the guy's shoulder. Adam Eve revives herself out of nowhere, lends a helpful blast, and then when Conquest breaks Mark's other hand, this guy uses his head and headbutts Conquest over and over and over again. It was like 15 hits until what was once his head is now a stomped on can of crushed tomatoes. I don't know if we can even show this one, but it's just insane. Number three, Squirrel Girl versus Doctor Doom. Look, we're talking comic books here, okay? Just Keep that in mind. In Marvel Super Heroes number 8 from 1992, in one corner, we've got the full, untested, unbridled powerhouse of Squirrel Girl. And then, in the other corner, we have the Fantastic Four's top enemy, the ruler of Latveria, the man who has wielded the power of the Beyonder, constantly blends incredible technology with powerful magic and artifacts, fueled by his massive, deserved ego. It's the one and only Dr. Victor Von Doom. Who's the winner? Obviously, it's Squirrel Girl, what the hell? Summoning a monstrous horde of squirrels that completely swarm Doom as he cries out, my much vaunted technology decimated by these gnawing rodents. And he escapes through a trap door, diving into a river and leaving behind his mask, which Squirrel Girl takes as a trophy. Of all the defeats on this list, this one is definitely brutal. Completely tore that man's pride straight from him and sent him running and screaming with a whole cacophony of squirrels. Damn. That was kind of fun. <clears throat> Number two, Mr. Dumpo. 
I know, I'm surprised the Punisher has not shown up on this list too, until now. Honestly, I can tell you why. The Punisher doesn't really have that many memorable villains because his whole thing is that he doesn't let them live. Usually his villains are gone from existence by the end of the issue, and definitely before the end of the series. And usually, he does it very quickly and very easily. But definitely not always. In the Punisher Volume 5, number 11, the Punisher is facing off against a guy called the Russian, who was hired by another bigger bad who we talk about just, just in a moment. When the two finally come face to face, the fight sees them tumble through Frank's apartment building, crashing into the apartment of Frank's neighbor, Mr. Dumpo. Mr. Dumpo is not the smallest man. In, in fact, I'd say he's quite large. Yeah, that's how I'd put it. Using a fresh out of the oven scolding hot slice of pizza belonging to Mr. Dumpo, Frank burns the Russian's face, and then Frank then takes Mr. Dumpo and tosses him on top of the Russian and dogpiles on top, suffocating the Russian to his demise. Could you imagine going out like that? Just take a moment and think about it. That would be horrible. Number one, Ma Nyochi. That's how I'm gonna say it. I said we were about to talk about another Punisher villain, and I wasn't lying. Ma Nyochi, or Nyochi, or however you, tell me how you pronounce that in the comments below, just, I can't figure it out. She's the head of the Nyochi crime family, so yeah, she ain't really a nice lady. Now, before the moment I'm about to talk about, Frank had thought that he had already neutralized the threat of old Ma here, and that's because he literally fed her to a gaggle of polar bears. Now, while they didn't finish her off, the bears did happen to relieve Ma of her arms and legs. It was that action that prompted the hiring of the Russian at the last point. Now in the Punisher Volume 5, number 12, after taking down about 80, yes, 80 of her thugs, Punisher comes back to finish the job. 80 men were already obliterated, so no one was willing to lend the legless and armless head of crime a hand as Frank burned down her mansion. She put up a decent fight with no limbs though, sort of, after she attempted to gnaw his ankles off unsurprisingly unsuccessfully. Frank uses his big old foot, plus the muscles in his leg, and not so gently places this helpless, horrible woman into the burning pyre that used to be her home. Cold. Or hot, actually, cause fire. Number 10, Venom's deadly French kiss. Venom is already known for being a brutal and twisted character in general, especially when he acts as a villain. Yet he's still one of the most popular characters around, no matter his alignment. In 2003's Venom in issue 11, we saw him take on the thing from the Fantastic Four and use a weird talent we didn't really need to know that he had. Venom is attempting to drag away Spider-Man's unconscious body when the thing bursts through a wall, aiming to prevent him from doing so by tackling him. Venom responds by telling the thing it's blobberin' time and shoots out his tongue, essentially giving the thing an immobilizing and disturbingly painful looking French kiss. Fortunately, Human Torch comes in on the next page to put a stop to Venom, but this graphic image won't be as easily burned away. In fact, just the opposite be burned into your mind. The cover of this issue says it all, featuring just Venom's long and slimy looking tongue. Ew. Number 9. Loki and Thor Brutalize the Fantastic Four This one came to us from a what if story where we saw both Loki and Thor team up to take on Marvel's first family, the Fantastic Four. During this fight, we got a brutal moment where Ben Grimm as the Thing tries to shout out his famous catchphrase while battling Thor. It's clobberin' time! But before he can get that final word out, time, Thor smashes his jaw off with his hammer. Youch. Meanwhile, Invisible Woman Sue Storm is also in trouble. She is attempting to protect herself using a force field she created, but Loki reverses the polarity of her powers, so all the energy she is projecting outward instead folds in on her, causing her to be crushed beneath its weight and looking almost skeletal as a result in one panel. She's like, I'm dying. Number 8. Gamora Kills Eros In a surprising turn of events, Gamora was forced to take the life of her uncle Star Fox following the revelation that the Black Order would be using him him and not Gamora, as he had previously thought, to bring Thanos back to life. Much to the dismay of Star-Lord, Gamora did not hesitate to kill her uncle Eros, Thanos' brother, though at least she did seem sorry to have to do it. But if it meant preventing Thanos' return, well, then she was more willing to do the deed, stabbing Star Fox right through the chest with her sword. Number 7. Kitty is forced to kill Wolverine Kitty's kills can be pretty gruesome when they happen because of her phasing powers. In this story, Kitty was forced to kill Wolverine when he couldn't 
be safe from being used as Hydra's brainwashed agent in What If Wolverine Enemy of the State. Wolverine has been teleporting in, assassinating tons of Hydra's opponents, aka superheroes, and teleporting out. A team is then pulled together to finally take him down, and one of that team's members, Kitty, is one of the few left at the end. She tries to reason with Wolverine, but when that fails, is forced to face her arm through his head, turning it solid just before Wolverine slices it off. Wolverine is dead, Kitty's without an arm, and likely every reader was either left with a shocked look on their face or tears in their eyes, or both. Number six, Wally West versus Inertia. Inertia was a young villainous Thaddeus Thawne. Inertia is to Bart Allen, aka Impulse, what Eobard Thawne is to Barry Allen. He is his reverse. Now, Inertia had been raised his whole life to absolutely despise speedsters of any kind. He learned to be a villain from others, but his actions were all of his own. So, when Inertia made the mistake of taking the life of his opposite, Bart Allen, he would be made to suffer the consequences. Unfortunately for him, those consequences came in the form of Wally West, one of the most powerful speedsters ever. After taunting Wally about the fact he just took the life of his sidekick, in All Flash number 1, Wally takes the young villain who had the potential to be reformed, mind you, and removes his ability to move at all, traps Inertia in a museum as one of the exhibits, only able to blink once every hundred years, and leaves the kid there still thinking in real time during all of this, meaning he's driven slowly and pretty surely insane. And just as the cherry on top, Wally left him facing the exhibit of Bart Allen, the man that Inertia could have been. It's an incredibly dark fate for a hero to impose on a villain, especially one that small. Number 5, Superman vs. The Joker. The Injustice video game and comic books took the simple premise of an evil Superman and turned it into an awesome story with really cool moments. The designs created for the heroes are mostly really, really cool and only slight variations of their best looks. The reasons that heroes and villains choose sides against one another is also really, really cool, and it gives some of the most ridiculous shows a force for Superman himself. But it all kicks off with one simple event. The Joker decides that he has become bored of Gotham, so he turns his gaze on Metropolis. The dark and twisted games that this character plays work really well with Batman, who is in reality just a normal human named Bruce Wayne. But when the Joker has to face someone with actual power, he is exponentially way more likely to come out on the bottom. So when he decided to crack Superman by tricking the hero into ending the life of Lois Lane and then blowing up a large part of Metropolis, he does succeed for just a few hours, until Superman shows up in the room where the clown is being interrogated by Batman, and Superman just bursts in, ignoring Batman completely, and in one cold move, he plunges his fist straight through the Joker's chest, stopping his heart immediately. And number four, Midnight vs. Commander. The Authority is a really, really cool group from DC Comics' Wildstorm universe. The two most well-known heroes from the team would be Apollo and Midnighter, who are basically like Superman and Batman. Man, respectively, only these two are husband and husband, and Midnighter is almost insane. He is like Batman, but like Batman who is also mixed with the Punisher and maybe like a bit of Deadpool. And these stories get dark. In Mark Miller's run on the Authority, a villain by the name of Commander makes the very big mistake of attacking and forcing himself on Apollo. This was a hell of a mistake, because in response to those actions, Apollo, after recovering, burns Commander's legs so that he can't escape, and Midnighter shows up with a jackhammer. And the rest is something we are kept from seeing. If you want to check it out for yourself, you may be my guest, but you've been warned, it is quite haunting. Number 3, Captain Cold vs. Johnny Quick. If you have not read Forever Evil, I highly recommend you do. It's such a dark and crazy story that sees the villains of the DC Universe step into the heroic side to take down an evil Justice League from the alternate reality of Earth 3. Each member of this crime syndicate of America is a sick and twisted perversion of their prime Earth counterpart. But of all of them, Johnny Quick, the stand-in for The Flash, may be the most messed up. He's a completely deranged serial killer in his world. And one villain just can't stand for someone dragging the Flash's name in the dirt like that. Leonard Snart, Captain Cold. In their confrontation, Mr. Quick gets a hold of Cold's weapon, the Cold Gun, and then gloats about how he had taken the life of the alternate Snart on Earth 3, and how Captain Cold is defenseless without his finger on the trigger of his weapon. Well, it turns out that Snart singing Jingle Bells, Batman Smells activates the Cold Gun voice trigger, which then completely freezes Quick's leg, which is when Captain Cold takes his big old right boot heel and completely shatters this maniac's leg. Have fun accessing the speed force now, psycho! <laughs> 
In at number two, Black Panther and the Skrulls. Wakanda, like the other fictional kingdoms of Atlantis and Latveria, is protected by a man who will do anything to protect his people. T'Challa doesn't really have the luxury of sparing those that would do harm to his incredibly advanced home. But Wakanda is also one of the number one places targeted when an invading force wants to take over Earth. So, taking those two facts into account, when the Skrulls tried to invade Wakanda to start their mission of dominating the world, T'Challa and his wife Storm of the X-Men left those aliens with a clear message. After tricking the Skrulls into inflicting pain on their own men for information, the Skrulls sent out their best warriors for the task of taking down the pair. But just as those toughest warriors are gone from sight, an army of Wakandan soldiers breaks into the Skrull ship and leaves not a single Skrull soul alive. While that's happening, those quote toughest warriors are turned into pulp by Black Panther, with T'Challa using their blood to write quote, this is what happens when you invade Wakanda on the bridge of the Skrull ship, cold. Number one, Constantine versus Dr. Fate. It's funny, I never really thought I'd see Dr. Fate as a villain. And in a way, this isn't exactly that. It's more like the helmet of fate and Naboo himself is the villain. In Constantine Future's End, John has stolen the helmet of fate, who without a wearer is just a measly old artifact with one of the world's most powerful sorcerers trapped inside. Allowing himself to get ensnared by the helmet, linking John and Naboo's minds, John trapped Naboo in the auditorium of Anubis. He fairly challenges Naboo to prove that he has actually ever cared about anyone other than himself in front of the ancient Egyptian god. If Naboo wins, then Constantine dies and Naboo is free to do what he does. Despite his great deeds though, he can't actually prove that he cares about anyone. When Constantine summoned the helmet, it immediately started influencing people to come and claim the helmet and save Naboo. But Constantine had set up a man to subdue each person that was called by the helmet, and when one person didn't make it, another would be called, and then another, and another, and so on. Each person just being used as a tool by Naboo, who didn't care what happened to any of them. He proves that Naboo doesn't give a damn, and then Naboo is eaten by Anubis, just straight up eaten. Now it turns out, even the challenge was a trick, with Constantine making a deal with the demon Ifrit, who now inhabits the Helmet of Fate in the place of, and sort of alongside, Naboo, bargaining with those who choose to wear the helmet from this point forward. Kicking off with the stat number 10, Wolverine vs Hulk. This one is wild, okay? We all know Wolverine is ripped and he gets really ripped in this one and I don't mean ripped like jacked either I mean ripped like in half this one comes from Wolverine vs Hulk and it's more than brutal so in this story Wolverine is sent to Tibet to assassinate the Hulk the problem is he's the Incredible Hulk so it may sound easier than it looks so when the battle between these two started up it's loud it's messy and it's gonna be pretty violent Hulk picked Wolverine up and literally broke him into two, tossing his lower half up a mountain and leaving Wolverine's torso bleeding in the snow down below. Just another day in the Ultimates, you know? Being the world's greatest tracker and all, Wolverine smelt his legs that were a few miles up the mountain and then did a really slow, really painful climb to get those smelly feet back where they belong. The series was actually delayed in real life, so this journey up the mountain to get his legs back took three years for readers to finally see. Imagine if you had to wait that long to see the next episode after like a Breaking Bad finale or something. Three years? That's insane. I couldn't do it. And before we head over to number nine, guys, if you wanted to go ahead and give us a thumbs up for this video, that would be great. It helps out the studio a lot. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's dive back into this list. Number nine, Batman vs. Bane. Directed by, of course, Christopher Nolan, who had done the previous installments, comes a pretty epic conclusion to the Dark Knight trilogy. Released in 2012, The Dark Knight Rises, as you can guess from the title alone, is about Batman rising up. From where? Why? What's going on? Well, how about a broken back thanks to Bane? So this is eight years after the Joker had a run-in with Gotham City. So now Batman has returned to take down Tom Hardy as he mumbles and frowns aggressively in this film. We get one of my favorite fight scenes from any superhero movie. And what I love about this scene so much is that there's no music to it at all. All you hear is Batman legitimately struggling to try and fight this dude. And it makes it more realistic. <laughs> It's stressful and you can see Bruce become more and more exhausted by each punch and it all comes to a screeching halt when Bane picks up Bruce for one last blow right to the spinal cord. Spirit. <laughs> oh, your money. 
Now, I know people like to give this movie a hard time, but seeing Batman get his ass kicked like this reminds me that it's not always the hero that gets the last punch. Number eight, Magneto vs. Wolverine. Look, I'll be honest, I'm a nail biter, okay? And there's days where I can't even muss up the strength to pull a hangnail out of my own finger or whatever. It sucks, I can't deal with pain, especially when something's coming out of my body, which makes the next one on this list really brutal for me to read. Now, I couldn't imagine if all of my bones were suddenly ripped out of my body. That's a nightmare. And that's exactly what happens to Wolverine when Magneto has had enough of his nonsense. Yeah, this all takes place during the Fatal Attractions event. So Wolverine doesn't even have a chance to scream. The adamantium that bonded to his bones erupted outwards like water bursting through a dam. And he's still breathing when this happens. I mean, if this isn't one of the worst things to go through, I couldn't tell you what is. Definitely not one of my hangnails. This one is probably a little bit more painful. Thankfully, thankfully, Xavier wiped Magneto's memory of the whole event and Wolverine was out of commission for a while recovering. I mean, he had mental spikes sticking out of his body. I don't think he's gonna get any chores done in the meantime. Number seven, the Avengers vs. Thanos. The Russo brothers came in the MCU with the Winter Soldier, and we got that sick, awesome elevator scene, and then we got Civil War. They make some pretty fun movies. My personal favorite of the bunch is still Infinity War. I mean, all these characters who led their own franchise, crammed into one single movie, shouldn't have worked out as well as it did. It's a smooth flick. So we see Thanos as he walks his way through the universe collecting the cosmic infinity stones. First, he decimates Xandar for the power stone, gave Loki the old one to choke for the space stone, and then he punched the Hulk so hard in the neck that he quit being the Hulk. And this is like the first 10 minutes of the movie. So the movie itself is a brutal fight, but of course it comes down to the last stone, the last attempt the Mind Stone, the stone that is Vision, it's in his forehead. So after a last effort attempt of removing the stone in Wakanda, Wanda Maximoff is forced to destroy it. So while she's working on that, all of our Avengers are getting destroyed by the powers that Thanos now obtains, but they don't come out on top in this one. Vision gets that big yellow black head pulled right out of his forehead, and then the theater sat silent, and we just watched Vision's lifeless and colorless body fall to the ground. Seeing the Avengers lose like this, especially Vision, was definitely one of the more brutal beatdowns in an MCU movie. Number six, She-Hulk tears Vision in half. This was during one of the times in Marvel history where Scarlet Witch basically went crazy, believing the whole world to be against her, and taking it out on that. During the Avenger Disassembled storyline, she was blaming the Avengers for the loss of her children, which she had altered reality to create, as, you know, Vision, her husband, was not actually capable as an artificial life form of fathering children. Wanda decided to attack the Avengers, but indirectly. She appeared to send an altered Vision to do so instead. Her influence also caused She-Hulk to go into an uncontrollable rage. When this happened, She-Hulk saw Vision as the main threat and so ripped him in half. Of course, Vision would later return, this definitely wasn't the end for him, and the two would even reconcile. But just seeing this happen in the pages of a comic was still pretty intense. Anytime someone gets ripped in half, it's pretty intense. Number five, Hulk gets indigestion. In the alternate timeline that belongs to Old Man Logan, we witness a potential future where Logan lives on land with his wife and two children that is owned by the Hulk gang. The Hulk gang are multiple generations of Hulk's inbred family. Bruce himself is still alive and demands doubled rent from the Logans. Old Man Logan sets out to collect this rent before the due date when his family is threatened, but unfortunately does not make it back in time, despite him actually arriving early in regards to their originally agreed upon date. Logan finds his family has already been killed in his absence and sets out hell-bent on revenge. Unfortunately, Logan doesn't seem to be much of a match for Hulk, who devours him. Of course, Logan may have actually been counting on that happening. While Hulk's body attempts to digest him, Logan pops his claws and cuts his way out of Hulk's stomach. We've seen Wolverine attempt this move a couple of times in the comics, but it doesn't get any less gruesome anytime he does it, especially with Steve McNiven on pencils. Number Four, Nova brutally disembowels Annihilus. This has got to be one of the most violent kills we've seen in the pages of a Marvel comic. During Annihilation in issue 6, we saw Nova, aka Richard Ryder, take on Annihilus and succeed in defeating him. But he didn't just defeat him, he disemboweled him. And not in a conventional way either, but by reaching down his throat, that's right, the brutal and violent end happened by Nova punching down into Annihilus' throat so far in fact that he somehow reached his organ. I don't know how that scientifically works, but there you go. And he pulled specifically what appeared to be his intestines out through his mouth. 
quite intense. I don't think you can actually do that to someone, but I'm not gonna ask if it's possible because I don't wanna know. Number three, Wolverine kills everyone. Not intentionally though. In this instance, he was tricked. During Mark Miller's Old Man Logan limited series, it was revealed that Mysterio tricked Wolverine into killing nearly everyone in the X Mansion. The staff, the students, his fellow colleagues, the X-Men. There were even more deaths as the supervillains took over the world, leaving us with the dystopian future that we see in this series. But by far, the thought of Wolverine slicing up everyone that he ever considered to be close enough to consider family, believing they were intruders and that he was protecting his own fellow mutants in doing so, is shocking. Also just him holding Jubilee, I was like, no. Number two, Black Panther becomes zombie food. In the Marvel Zombies world, Black Panther was one of the sole survivors when the zombies first attacked and turned most of his friends into zombified versions of themselves. One such former friend, Hank Pym, actually just managed to trick T'Challa into coming with him. Or, well, he almost did. He just almost, so close. Either way, Hank managed to incapacitate T'Challa, having already begun Begun to change himself. He used Black Panther, his friend, as a food source, keeping him locked away and alive, sawing off pieces of him, and slowly devouring him. Fortunately, Black Panther would escape and even become the leader of a land of survivors, although he would eventually turn into a zombie himself much later on. But that's a story for another time. Number one, Pop goes Doctor Strange, or his head. Ew. For this gory moment, we head to Ultimatum. I know, I'm sorry, but sometimes we gotta go back there. Now in Ultimatum, Doctor Strange took on an enemy that we've seen in battle multiple times before in the comics, Dormammu. And usually win against Dormammu even, but not this time. This time it was Dormammu who reigned victorious after using Doctor Strange's cape to strangle him to death by wrapping tightly around him. So tight in fact that Strange's head exploded. There are a lot of cons for wearing capes in a fight in terms of practicality. I know this, but this has got to be one of the most horrific instances of one that I've ever seen in the comics. Number 10, Civil War 1. Oh boy, the first Civil War caused a great uproar and a good deal of problems in the superhero community. It also made Earth vulnerable to attack as it evidently involved just in fighting. When superheroes turn on each other, that's bad. When two main superheroes who are part of the same team turn on each other, that's ridiculous. And that's exactly what happened with Civil War 1. Well, the inciting incident that divided heroes wasn't caused by Iron Man or Captain America, and actually was pretty serious. They both had become leaders of two different approaches for how to best resolve that main issue. Iron Man believed that superhuman beings needed a shorter and tighter leash, basically, and should work with the government so they could kind of be overseen. Number nine. Axis. Axis was an event where we saw heroes and villains sort of do kind of like a role reversal. This happened as a result of a spell backfiring, cast by, well, you probably guessed it, none other than Scarlet Witch. Wanda, for being a powerful magic user, has kind of a challenging time with magic. Although, to be fair, she actually wasn't the only caster involved here, although she is the one that we often talk about. Doctor Strange started casting with her, and when he got taken out, Doctor Doom actually helped in his stead. So Doom is also possibly to blame as well. Even though Wanda Wanda usually takes a lot of the flack for this one. What launched the Axis event was Wanda and Doom attempting to cast this spell on the evolved and supremely powerful version of Red Skull, Red Onslaught, which sort of came about when Magneto was like, I know how to fix this, so I'll kill you, and then Red Onslaught happened, so it didn't work out so great. The spell actually succeeded, but kind of backfired in that many other heroes and villains within a certain radius also got hit with the spell unintentionally. Oops. Number eight, Hydra Cap. Hydra Cap is definitely a pretty bad thing that happened for the Avengers in, well, in many regards. One, Hydra Captain America is literally another version of Captain America who for a while we actually thought was the main continuity version for real. So. We're not off to a great start with that. Number two, the Avengers failed to stop Hydra Supreme Cap from taking over the US. Number three, some of the Avengers were even manipulated into joining Hydra and Hydra Cap's forces. Some of them were actually like possessed and some of them were just kind of made to do so. All around, it was just a rough time and not a great look for the Avengers overall. I'm actually surprised there isn't more pushback from the public today as a result of this one. Number seven, Iron Man joins Kang. Yeesh, the crossing. What a weird crossover event. Every time I think I'm over it, we come up with the list topic where I kind of can't help but like return to it. In this event, Iron Man, one of the main Avengers, was revealed to be secretly one of the baddest of the bad as we learned that Iron Man had actually been working for Kang, or rather, Kang's Immortus version, for years. That's right, it turns out that Iron Man is actually a sleeper agent for Kang, or he was. 
he kind of still is because he kind of got reconciled into one being but it's still the old Iron Man anyways as weird as it sounds this was actually an even worse weirdness than Captain America working for Hydra in my mind at least that made more sense to me Iron Man would fight against the Avengers and when they struggled to defeat him they called in a past version of himself for him to beat and uh, almost kill number six no versus Thor Spoilers coming in hot for King and Black by Donny Cates, okay, just so you guys are aware. So during the first battle with Null and his army of symbiotes, Thor was not to be found. The God of Thunder would be a perfect fight considering the weakness of the Horde being electricity and magic. Kinda makes sense. He'd be a pretty reliable chess piece to this violent game, no doubt about it. So when the God of Thunder finally arrived in issue 3 of King and Black, he brought a pretty epic battle with him. So Noel had come to Earth with his thousands of symbiote dragons, searching for Eddie Brock's son, Dylan. He's searching for you, Dylan. They're coming, man. And when he finally got a hold of Eddie, he stripped him of the symbiote and dropped him from the Empire State Building. Things are looking not so great. And then Thor returns, finally, in the next issue. So you're a god and a king, Thor asks. Good for you. Now allow me to teach you what those words truly mean. And he does just that. Of course, with the help of Tony riding in on an extremist-infected symbiote, it's just another week and a bit and we'll see this epic battle continue with issue four. But so far, it's up to a crazy, crazy awesome start. Number five, Spider-Man vs. Morlin. It's all fun and games until somebody gets poked in the eye. Or maybe if you're Spider-Man, it's all fun and games until you get your eye yanked out. Perhaps one of the worst things I could imagine, uh, in the Spider-Man storyline, the other, evolve or die, we see Spider-Man go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Morlin, and he gets his butt kicked. It gets so bad that Spider-Man actually breaks his knuckles while he's trying to fight this dude. That's how intense this battle already is. Things, of course, take a horrible turn for the worse when Morlin decides to grab Spider-Man's left eye and then yank. No, he didn't, Spider-Man says. Oh, yes, he did. I said out loud on the bus in front of people. Dude, he pulled his eyeball out, and then to make us feel even more sick than we already do, Morlin proceeds to eat his eyeball, and even commented on how delicious it was. But if I could ask one question, do the eye colors matter when it comes to like eyeball flavor? Like I got brown eyes, maybe that's like a, a maple-y kind of smoky kind of vibe. I don't know, maybe my eyes are pretty yummy. Somebody ask Army Hammer, see what he thinks about eyes. Number four. Hulk versus everybody. Okay, this one's pretty wild. So Thor Ragnarok was loosely based off of the Planet Hulk storyline. And I say loosely because in the comics, well, that story didn't end up going so well. See on Sakaar, the rocket that he arrived in ended up blowing to smithereens, causing some casualties that left him a little heartbroken to say the least. So he rolls his shoulders back a few times and then he heads back to Earth and thus begins the World War Hulk storyline. He just destroys everybody. I mean, all the heroes that Earth loves at this point just in the path of this death train. Like he locks the Illuminati in Madison Square Garden, and then he makes them fight to the death. That in itself is brutal. That's crazy. But I mean, I guess if you spend enough time on Sakaar, that just becomes second nature, you know? The whole story is a bloody good mess. I mean, it's great seeing the panic on the Avengers' faces this entire time. It's scary. So make sure if you haven't already to grab all five issues 2007's World War Hulk, because it's a treat. The whole thing's a big battle. Number three, Spider-Man close to home. So when a super villain escapes, it's not a great time. Usually they're gonna come back for the person that put them in there in the first place. So Ultimate Spider-Man's death is absolutely beautiful, and of course, it's really, really sad. It's done really well. So after tackling Captain America and literally taking a bullet for him, Peter is left to fight the Green Goblin, Electro, Sandman, Vulture, and Kraven. They are all waiting for him. They all wanted a piece of the spider, and in the end, they got what they wanted. The entire climax happens in Peter's neighborhood, basically. So everybody's running to safety, and he's limping around. He's doing his absolute best. He's pulling off fire hydrants and using Electro's current to do some damage to other guys. He's giving it everything he's got. And that's the beauty of this one. He's exhausted from the start. He gets shot before this fight even happens and you feel it while you're reading it. This is a plot that I think we're gonna finally see in the next Spider-Man movie. I mean, hopefully, with all these villains knowing Peter's true identity now, we could get them all literally showing up at his house, bringing the battle to him. Let's just hope it doesn't end the same way with Peter's heroic death. See, Miles actually saw this whole fight take place, so it actually inspired him to take on the mantle of Spider-Man. So these villains may have won this time, but Miles Morales is coming for him. Number two, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe. This issue was released in August 2012, and it is exactly what it sounds like. So what's the story here? Why does Wade want everybody dead? Well, the X-Men put Wade into the Ravencroft Asylum in attempts to heal his insanity. 
but the doctor wasn't too good at handling a task because the doctor was actually Dr. Psycho Man. So the procedure went well, I'd say. You know, something happened. He brainwashed Wade in hopes to shut down all these inner voices, and well, it worked. Awesome, hooray, there we go. It worked, but the only downside was those voices were now replaced with voices that were encouraging him to kill everybody in the Marvel Universe. And this is a must read. From start to finish, it is brutal, it is graphic, it's an easy one on this list. Number one, Iron Man vs. Captain America. Seeing two of your friends argue is uncomfortable enough, let alone seeing two of your superhero friends try and kill each other. Captain America Civil War is one of my favorite Marvel movies to watch because when these guys finally battle it out, there's years of history behind it. Captain America Civil War was released in 2016, directed again by the Russo brothers, and the whole movie is politics. It's superhero politics, like in the comic, minus, you know, most things from the comic like the school blowing up, for instance. Let's leave that part out of this movie. But in the film adaptation, Tony sides with the government and the Sokovia Accords. He feels responsible for the death of Charles Spencer, or rather with the whole weekend of Ultron stuff. Steve wants to protect Bucky, and freedom throughout the entire team definitely wouldn't hurt either. So eventually, due to Baron Zemo's sneaky little snake work, he gets Tony in the same room as Steve, and we see footage of a brainwashed Bucky kill Tony's parents. The next 10 minutes are just filled with them both trying to end each other. Tony even blasted Bucky's arm off during this fight. He's going for blood. So Cap decides last minute to stick the shield in Tony's suit, and that shield Tony made very clear didn't belong to Cap, and that it belonged to his father. Yeah. 